Did the company have an easier time toning Helen down than than <laughs> than? Great question. We'll no, never they, know. They, I, I, I can I can say <laughs> without getting fired tomorrow. That that thing with, that she's doing with her hair. <laughs> yeah, is, I is, is an indication of yeah. maybe. I'm 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 growing it. Um, <laughs> hair stretch. Um, I. I, I know for sure that there were many things that Helen wrote when Joni edited her or when other people edited her that made them profoundly uncomfortable, uh, but they never said no to her, never said no. When the AIDS thing happened and there was picketing in front of the buildings oh, yeah. that Hearst owned, right. they didn't like it, and I, I am going to gather a couple of them had to sit down, talk with her, but none of them shared that with me. However, they have never stopped her. Um, some of her books, the ones in the last 20 years, have been pretty raunchy, beyond raunchy, very instructive, a lot of how-tos. Um, and I think they squirmed, but they didn't read it before Joni got to read it, re edit it. They just don't do that at Hearst. Not for Helen. Well, Helen thing, was different. <coughs> she was different than anybody else. She could do the what she wanted. The other thing was the numbers when she got to Cosmo, almost instantly, it was a success. It kept making so much money. A, a plug well, for Helen. David, she and David had already worked out their philosophy for what they were going to. See, nobody knows that he was so influential behind her getting the job. He had worked for the Hearst before, correct? He had worked at Cosmo. Cosmo. Yeah, and so he had already seen that she had this unique point of view that was ahead of its time, and he knew how to encourage her to do it. While he was making movies on the side, mm -hmm. he was a kind of true intellectual. I mean, he yeah. was smart. He was very well read. He was literary. And he just stayed in the background and smiled. Yeah. And, uh, but he wrote those you know, saucy come-ons. Yeah. Well, he did a little few books of himself, How to Be a Gentleman and things, but the amazing yeah. thing about Cosmo that people here may not know is that it is published in 63 countries around the world, even in some Middle East countries where they tone it down a little bit. It is the largest magazine brand in the world. And when she took over, Hearst Corporation was failing. They were close to going bankrupt. And all the monies that she made through Cosmo uh, got used for them to be able to buy 20% of ESPN, which Hearst owns, launch Lifetime Network, mm -hmm. launch A&E. Fantastic. So Helen was the support system for the entire corporation. She also went to every single country where they were going to have Cosmopolitan kick off in another language, and she would charm them. And uh, even when she was really probably not capable anymore of, of putting out Cosmopolitan single-handedly, yeah. she, really... she was uh, influencing all of this foreign thing. And, and, you know, if you think of somebody like Steve Jobs, who was, you know, lionized and made a remarkable change in our use of digital. He got the business community behind him as a genius. Helen Gurley Brown, for all her little girl Mouseburger thing, she built a brand that has maybe more elasticity than iPhone and iPad because it is an extraordinary thing that can change to suit the times. And she never took bows for that. She got Oh, she is, you know, the sex queen. Never did she. She probably didn't even know how much the money came. I don't I'm, think I'm, she, she didn't care. I, I know that she was a person who never knew her own strength, and it was this: what you're t j exactly what you're talking about. And I never really thought of that until you mm -hmm. said it. She was an entrepreneur. 
when nobody else was, no magazine editor. Yeah, uh, I mean, she was so great that it used to drive me crazy that she didn't have a car and driver. And I'd say, but Mrs. Reeland, who's publishing Vogue, has a failure as a magazine. It's, Vogue didn't make any money then. But she has a car and driver. Well, Liz, I have to ride the bus because I need to see what my girls are wearing, what they're saying, what yeah. they're thinking. Yeah. And well, she tried to carry that on even after they gave her a car and driver, whether she wanted it or not. Well, she also she was also, as 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 some of you may have told me, um, she was a little bit miserly, as would be the. Um, <laughs> she she did not like to spend money, and there are sort of great stories about this, Joni. Do, oh, I I have many of them. The one that still back to that same scene. She lived, so David must have bought this, she lived in the Beresford on Central Park West and 79th Street in a, I think it was a triplex, the most extraordinary apartment, a beautiful, beautiful apartment. It was one apartment. of the towers. Yeah, in the towers, right. And I would go up there to edit, and because she always wanted to work in her home, I don't know why. And we would walk in, and it would be freezing, just so cold. <laughs> You know, it was just weird, and I would say, Could, I think the heat, do you have the heat on? Is the heat, it seems to be broken, and she'd go, oh, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so it started to be clear that she just didn't want to spend the money <laughs> to heat the apartment. And finally, when I really carried on, because I was freezing, she said, oh, let's go to the <laughs> top floor. And I thought, okay, <laughs> let me go up there. And she would light a fire, because there were fireplaces. And we'd huddle by the fire rather than put the heat on. And that was just like one example of many. I'd have to take the bus with her because she wouldn't get into even a taxi. I know. You know, one time I ran into Helen on the street. <laughs> it was during the Cannes Film Festival. So I had been having a ball not doing anything serious and filing when it occurred to me. And I run into Helen. And I said, Helen, I am so glad I'm taking you to the cutest place where I can never buy any clothes because they are size zero up to six. And I just love these things, but they'll be perfect for you. So we went in, she tried everything on, she looked adorable, you know, she was about a four or something. And I said, well, okay, pay, let's go. Oh, no, I'm not buying any of these. They're $76 a yeah. shirt or something. And so we leave, and I feel I've fa failed, you know, because I haven't convinced her. And then she says, let's go in here to Hermes. And she buys a whole lot of men's ties. Oh. And they're, you know, even uh. then they were $150 a piece, which was shocking. And I said, Helen, are you insane? You wouldn't buy the, the, this little dresses that I wanted you to buy that I can't fit into. And she said, oh, yes, but these are gifts, David's business gifts. I would never pay that for anything.